Welcome to another Socrates in the City event here at the home of Thomas Howard, the uh, great author, and uh, I'm happy to say my dear friend. Uh, he has written many books. Uh, in part one of this Socrates in the City interview with him, we talked principally about his book Chance of the Dance, which I could rave and rave about and, and typically do. Um, in this uh, hour, I want to talk to him about lots of other things. My conversations with him over the years have been so fascinating that I, I really just wanted to share uh, some of that with my Socrates in the City audience so that you uh, could also get a taste of, of, of Tom and uh, of his mind and be intrigued to want to read uh, his books. Uh, so we're here without a studio audience. You're, you're the audience. And so Hold, hold your applause. But I do have to say that uh, it, it means so much to me that uh, Tom and his dear wife, Loveless, have led us into their home uh, with all these cameras and microphones and things. But uh, it's, a, it's a privilege for me, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy it uh, nearly as much as I do. So stay tuned. Tom, let me, let me start with this uh, in, in the second part of our conversation. You know that I love you. And I can say that to you because you have an understanding of that word. My understanding of that word comes from things I've read by you and C.S. Lewis. But you, you know that I, that I love you. Yes. And it's such a joy to be with you that, uh, as I think I said before, I, I could almost talk to you about anything because uh, I enjoy talking to you. Uh, That's mutual, I have to say. I hope that doesn't yeah. embarrass you too much. No. But uh, I, I really, um, I, I revel in you and your emails and your letters and things. And actually, um, maybe a good place to start would be, we were talking before about your relationship with Lewis. And uh, I asked you whether you'd kept any of the correspondence with him. And you said you thought it was in the Wade Center yeah, at Wheaton Wade. College. Yes. And you were at least slightly incorrect. Oh, because uh, in the other room, I just happened to find a framed letter oh, yeah. from C.S. Lewis okay. to Tom Howard. I think you're the Tom Howard in the letter. Yes. Dear Mr. Howard, yeah. Yeah. Magdalen College, Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge. This was, yeah, in 1958, he was, he was boat, in Cambridge. Right, yeah. um, and when I read this to you earlier, you, you almost memorized it. I just can't believe, first of all, his handwriting. What the heck? Amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Right? Legible. It's legible. <laughs> Yeah. Um, dear Mr. Howard, oh, but believe me, you are still only paddling in the glorious sea of Tolkien. Mm. Go in for the Hobbit at once. Go on from the Hobbit. Go on from the Hobbit at once to the Lord of the Rings, semicolon. Three, Three volumes. volumes. And nearly as long as the Bible, but not a word too long. Something Three like volumes that and nearly as long as the Bible, and not a word too long, parentheses, except for the, for first, the first chapter. Which is a botch. <laughs> which is a botch. Yeah. Don't be friend. put off by it. That's, this is hilarious. Is this yeah. in, in Walter Hooper's uh, volumes? Of, is this letter in there? I don't know. I mean, the I, idea that, <laughs> this is delicious. That, 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 that <laughs> Lewis is calling the first chapter of Lord of the Rings a botch. A botch. But he yeah. loves the rest of it oh, yeah. as much as anything. Yeah. And then he says, The Hobbit is merely a fragment of his myth, detached and adapted for, for children. children. And losing much by the adaptation. And losing yeah. much by the adaptation. Yeah. The Lord of the Rings is the, the real stuff. stuff. Thanks for all the nice things you say. About my, my own, own little efforts. Little efforts. Yours sincerely, C.S. Lewis. This is. Uh, how much can I pay you for this? Would you take? Would you take? Uh, no. Um, what do you say? That's. I mean, you look. I neglected to say this in the first hour. You taught at Gordon College for a long time. So you were uh, a, a professor at the college level for, for a long time, and I, maybe I assume people know that, but uh, many wouldn't. Um, you taught English literature. Did you yeah. teach Tolkien? The English syllabus, I had to follow it. And 
I'm not sure that I ever actually did formally get a section to well, copy, maybe, which maybe, I would have loved. But isn't know? it because uh, when you were teaching uh, college, maybe they wouldn't have thought of Tolkien as, as being worthy yet of being yeah. part of the canon? Yeah, I'm not sure. Right? I mean, that's my guess. Maybe yeah. they even think of, yeah. of Lewis as being worthy of, of being part of the yeah. canon, even in a Christian college like yeah. Gordon. But I think I could have made it worthy of the canon. I mean, I think they would have, you know, eaten up uh, what, if you really unpack what The Lord of the Rings is all about. You know? Well, okay, then what is The Lord of the Rings all about? Is this where I get to admit that I've not read yeah. it? Yes, but you, you can still get into heaven, possibly. I've yeah. read Chance of the Dance just many by, times, so I think it's Eric, the... Yeah. It's the but, yeah. what, what, so, what is the fascinating... I mean, there are many people that rave and rave about Tolkien, and yeah. there are many people that are unaware of, of Tolkien. Yeah. I've heard people rave about him. I feel like I know lots about him. Yeah. I know that he was instrumental in leading C.S. Lewis to faith in yeah. Jesus, which yeah. is an outrageous and amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. But what is, uh, what is it about Tolkien for you? Well, I, th I think he does a, an almost incredible job, piece of work, by opening out for us deprived, benighted moderns, uh, opening out the, the world of, of myth, of saga, of um, a the ancient glory of narrative. Um, I, I think that's what you know, it, his work is, I would suspect, is unique in the modern epoch. Yeah. I am struck, very struck, by reading this letter, the way Lewis writes about the Lord of the Rings. I, I, yeah. I confess that I wasn't aware of his admiration for yeah. it at that level. Yeah, yeah. What do you, what do you think it is about Tolkien that... Lewis so loved and admired. I think it's it's a tribute to Tolkien's own capacity of of soul to to see and love magnificence where which one is drawn into in the saga yeah. of the Lord of the Rings. Do, do you remember when you read the the so-called space trilogy when you read those books? You mean Lewis's? Lewis's Out of the uh, Silent Planet, Planet and Paralandra and, and uh, That Hideous Strength. Yeah. It must have been while I was still in school. I'm, I'm not sure whether I had gone on to college by that time. I was a slow starter. Yeah. <laughs> I of, often think that Paralandra is maybe Lewis's best book. I've never heard anyone share my opinion, but I think that well of it. Well, I couldn't disagree with you. I, I mean, it, it's a terribly hard choice. You know, what's Lewis's best work? <laughs> right. Uh, well, the fi there are passages toward the end of Paralandra which are just flights of luminous. beautiful just, yeah. language like I've never read. I mean, people yeah, rave about yeah. Gabriel Garcia Marquez or, you know, the, I've never read anything better than yeah. some of the passages there. But even the idea behind Paralandra, I mean, I think yeah. of it as, yeah. I assume you taught Milton over the years. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so I think of Paralandra as his response to Paradise Lost, yeah. and it ought to be taught in classes. In tandem in, 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 with that, yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Next time I teach it <laughs> in another life, uh, that would, that would be a perfect duo. Wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, it's amazing. All you have to do yeah. is read his preface to Paradise Lost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's and then you read Paralandra, and you yeah. can't even... Yeah. But it's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. It just... It's just... Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think the other two books... I, I don't want to say pale by comparison, but I, I really think it stands... Out of the Silent Planet and That Hideous Strength. Yeah. That Hideous yeah. Strength almost doesn't belong in the trilogy. It's a weird thing that yeah, it's... it's yeah, you, you, you suddenly brought down to uh, meat and potatoes, sort of in a way. <laughs> right. Yeah. What do you think of Lewis's idea that the word space for outer space is the wrong word? Oh, yeah. Do you, do you remember him yeah. talking about that? Uh, yes, and 
I can't remember the exact passage, but I think his point there, was space to a modern reader means emptiness, you know, uncharted emptiness, yeah. uh, vacuity right. almost, whereas in the, the, the ancient, and I think uh, Lewis and Tolkien and everybody would say the real meaning of space, it's the wrong n noun for the, the world, the... Uh, the heavens. The, yeah, the heavens that, that is bespoken in those works. Uh, space would be the wrong one, you know. He, they, they all spoke of get, getting in, not not out into space, but in, getting in. Uh, you know, we're the we're the outsiders. You know. Well, I th it's probably the first space journey uh, from out of the silent planet where he goes uh, to Mars. Yeah. Um, where he's remarking on what he sees outside the space capsule, and it's. Yeah. It's the opposite of empty space. Yeah. It's, uh, it's glory. It's it? glory. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of a medieval idea, right? When you think of the medieval... Yeah. Uh, the, you, you know the Michael Ward book, Planet Narnia? No, I, I actually haven't read it. I'm you, sorry. Well, oh, Tom, it is... But, I mean, it's this idea, <laughs> basically. It's okay. this idea that, that Lewis thought uh, with this medieval mind, and he yeah. thought of the seven medieval planets, Yeah. and... It suffused everything that, that he wrote. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it and, did. And that's so you pick up a little bit of that in the in the space trilogy when he's writing about what we call outer space. Yeah. That it's yeah. It's you're entering these realms. Yeah. Uh, I think it's because he loved that his his being, his bosom, his soul loved loved that dimension, that that opening out yeah. onto real dimensions. You know. Uh, just the, the sheer, I was going to say size, but I think it's the, the glory of it, not just mere size, but uh, you're, you're drawn into the meaning of the word glory. The weight of glory, do you remember anything about Lewis's idea of glory? Uh, when, he, when, when he talks about glory, oh, yeah. what, what, is, what does he mean? I mean, the weight yeah. of glory. Yeah. I think when he says that, you know, it's, uh, I think he, I was going to say he chose the word weight, but I wonder whether he even chose it. It, 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 it named the thing that he understood and knew, you know, the weight of glory. It's, it's not vaporous. It's not cloudy and, uh, you know, thinly drawn and so on. It's, yeah, it's it's not a. It's something m more heavier, more solid than than our notion of space or right. light or something. Well, yeah. he gets at that in the Great Divorce, right? Yeah, in other words, that's this idea that uh, the weight of glory. these are the shadow lands, yeah. and that the more real something is, the yeah. more mass it has, the heavier it is. Yeah, so you yeah. get that picture of people that can't walk on the grass. Yeah, the yeah, because it's. Yeah. Where, where, where did Lewis get that idea from? I don't know that I've ever seen it anywhere else. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah. I think he got it because of his own perspicacity, I mean, in, in reading that stuff. I'm, I'm sure his brilliant capacity, intellectual and spiritual, you might say, um, was uh, turned on. By, by that, I mean he realized this is this is the real stuff, and the the word for it isn't isn't just outer space or something mm -hmm. because that's a that's a thin picture, you know that's a, a picture of thinness. Uh, whereas he wanted to continue that more ancient idea mm -hmm. of this is where substance is. We 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 live in a thinly drawn state of affairs. We hardly see. He even uses the word nobly uh, one time when he's when he's trying to speak of reality. You know, it's you know it's not it's not vaporous. It's not cloudy. It, uh, you know, it's not misty. It's solid and nobly. You know, if you talk about Lewis having a medieval Christian yeah. worldview, which is yeah. what you write about in your book *Chance of the Dance*, mm -hmm. it seems inescapably somehow. Catholic. It's pre-Reformation. Oh, yeah, no question. 
Um, yeah. t- tell us about that, since you, at some point, yeah. swam the, the Tiber. old Tiber. <laughs> you, do you, you see that as a reconciliation, in, in a way, to these ideas that, that the evangelicals kind of thin things back out, that, uh, that we... Uh, some, somebody the other day said to me that you know the word um, the word was made flesh, but sometimes we we, we make it back into words. And yeah, the word is made I think word. The, the one thing that Lewis captures and you captures is that incarnational aspect. That oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. I mean, Mary certainly didn't give birth to a a, a ghost or a, an idea. You know, she certainly would have had a. Uh, a unique take on what incarnation means. I mean, the word became the word became flesh. I mean, of all inglorious things, you know, flesh and blood and meat and vomit and <laughs> all the rest of that. You know, uh, that's uh, that's worth pondering. When God wanted to be known, he became a an infant with dirty diapers and the whole nine yards, you know. Well, yeah, and it's hard dignified. to it's hard to to want. I mean, it, it's a uh, it's tempting to want to spiritualize it back into mm. some Platonic form or yeah, something. Yeah, that's like Manichaeanism. That. That's a, that's afraid of the the flesh and the gook that goes along with it. You know. I, I guess I would argue, having written a biography of Luther, that in a way Luther oh. was trying to pull the church back to an incarnational view of things. And this, I'm not here to debate the I Reformation, but I, but I think know. that he saw something that had begun to be lost because of the focus on Aristotle and, and some of that kind That's of thing. That's interesting. I think you're dead right. I mean... Wow. No, I, I was expecting a hard, horrible argument. No um, way. I'm on your side. It's, <laughs> it's, you taught... T.S. Eliot over the years. Yeah. I, I don't mean you taught him as a student. You no, taught no. his work, obviously. Yes. Your book on the four quartets is called Dove Descending, and I found Dove Descending about the four quartets much more interesting than the four quartets. I was going to say, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> help, help me with this. Well, I mean, I would I would have to demur because I, I, I would say... Truly, to enter into the substance of four quartets, you know that's that's the reality of it. That's that's the weight, <laughs> uh, and the best I could do was like literary criticism. You're just talking about something. If you want to talk about marriage, you can say, well, it's this, 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 and this. You know all these characteristics of marriage, but you have to talk to a person who has, who is married, who has been married, who has entered into what is. Uh, contained in in that word, what that what that draws us into. The, the only problem is, uh, and I'm not here to put down T. S. Eliot, but uh, mm. y- your writing about the four quartets is is great writing. I mean, you could make the same argument, and you could have been incredibly abstruse and unreadable, and say, well, then someone can write a book about my book. But the the the, the difficulty of the four quartets. Which, which uh, Eliot wrote, of course, after he had converted to Christianity, yeah. strikes me as unnecessarily off-putting. Uh, in other words, really? a lot of more modern literature and art, I, I think, revels in being off-putting. Look, we know he already did that in the wasteland. He's, you know, he's writing yeah. footnotes to his own poem. And yeah. Yeah. D- don't you find that at least somehow partaking of? Uh, of a modern idea that's at war with some of the things that we're talking about? Very much so. And I, you know, I don't know exactly where Eliot's imagination was at that point in his biography. Uh, but, of course, he, he, he became Catholic, either Anglican or Roman. I can't remember uh, which it was. But, you know, someone who sees it almost has to um, he would feel a little, uh, little constrained by what what one might call mere Protestantism and so on. I mean, um, 
Yeah, well, I could just leave it well, at that. Well, theologically, yeah, but yeah. I'm saying that his writing, to my mind, and I'm very happy to be wrong, but it doesn't seem to reflect that. In other words, when you read the love song of, of J. Alfred, J. Alfred Prufrock, Prufrock yeah. it's loaded with beautiful images and yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and language that you revel, you want to revel in. Yeah, uh, very much so. The Four Quartets is almost the opposite of that. It seems so abstract. If it weren't for your book about it, I don't know that I would ever have, yeah. have even tried to read the Four Quartets past the yeah. first couple of pages. Well, they're not they're the first couple of lines for that matter. Yeah. Um, you know. at, at what point did it occur to you um, I mean, let's just start with joining, let's say, the uh, the Church of England, the yeah, Episcopal yeah. Church in America, yeah, yeah. to go from being a low church fundamentalist evangelical, right. um, Protestant, who's yeah. Protestant, whose father uh, was the editor of the Sunday School Times, School yeah, Times, School and Times. so on and so forth, and whose sister is the famous Elizabeth Elliot, and it, it, to, to to say, I want to join. A more sacramental church. Yeah. Did you did you count the cost? Was that difficult for you at the time? Uh, that's that's a very good question. I I uh, I think I, I counted the cost, but I didn't know how much the cost was going to cost. <laughs> well, uh, I, I I'm guessing the cost from to to. Uh, I mean, you 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 made you jumped over two broomsticks, so to speak, right? First, you become an Episcopalian, yeah, yeah. and then at some point, yeah. you uh, you become a Roman Catholic. Yeah. How many years, roughly, was that journey? Yeah. I mean, it would have been a few years, maybe. I don't know whether it was ten or fifteen or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Did it cause a stir when you yes. became an Episcopalian? Oh, first? no, I don't no. think so because. A lot of people do that. I mean, Lewis was an Anglican, and you know, everybody good was okay. Episcopalian or okay. Anglican, people that who were safe. Right. Uh, and uh, but Rome, I mean, golly, no, give me, give me a break. Right. Whenever I would hang out with somebody like Walter Hooper, uh, yeah. or you know, so many people have said, and Walter Hooper is of course convinced. He says that oh, Lewis had he lived, of course, yes. Lewis had he lived, of course, uh, would have yeah. become. Yeah. A Roman Catholic, and uh, I retorted, Flannery O'Connor, had she lived, uh, would have become uh, a Pentecostal evangelical. Um, that was a joke, yeah, but uh, right. but the point is that you can never really know what people are going to do. Uh, but what do you think of that idea that Lewis was on his way to Rome? We know that Walter Hooper, like you and, and many other people, uh, I admire. Um, uh, became at some point uh, converted to Roman Catholicism. But what do you think of the idea yeah. that Lewis m might have done that? Uh, I think there's a lot of substance in it, but I think in, in nuts and bolts, feet on the ground reality, I don't think Lewis would have jumped the Tiber uh, because... Um, I just don't think it was. That's where. He, that's not where his being was. Uh, he might have, in a in a theoretical discussion or a, in ecclesiological quarrel or something, right. he might have granted a certain number of points. Blah blah blah. Many Catholics love Lewis, and they sort of treat him as yeah, as, yeah. as an honorary member of the club. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, similarly, Lewis touches on certain ideas. I mean, he doesn't really get into the theology on the nose, but he suggests in books like uh, The Great Divorce and s some other books, some of the Narnia stuff that... Uh, well, actually, no, he did write about it, but, but about the idea of purgatory. I mean, he's yeah. willing to grant yeah. some things oh, yeah. that suggest he was open to Roman yeah. Catholic theology. Yeah, certainly. Just... Yeah, to the, the the whole Catholic vision of, of reality. Yeah. Uh, but purgatory thing. becomes confusing to Protestants and evangelicals. Uh, what, what do you say to somebody who says, I don't get I, it? I, they don't get it because they haven't thought about it. 
it's a heresy. So it's something that papists made up out of whole cloth. Okay, if that's not the case, what is, what is the case for it? Well, it, it depends on what picture one has of it. I mean, what do we know about uh, the, the, the flowering, the, the coming to fruit and so on like that, of what needs to be done in me before I'm ready for purity and, and bliss uh, and so on, what, what the meaning of paradise. You know, I don't think purgatory is God wrapping me over the knuckles with a celestial ruler to make me shape up. It's, it's drawing and leading and enabling me to go through the calisthenics that will make me capable of exulting in glory, exulting in the, the precincts of perfection. Uh, how, the, how the hell do I, how the heaven do I get there, yeah. you know? Uh, and the, the state I'm in right now, kind of um, flaccid and uh, floppy and weak and so on, uh, I ain't ready for that. I mean, I got to do some grunting and sweating. And that's not the idea of earning heaven. I think it's entering into the truth and the reality well, I mean, of what especially holiness is. If it's, a, if it's a response to grace. In other words, if I do work grace is the whole thing. in response to grace, yeah. uh, in gratitude yeah. for the opportunity, yeah. in a sense, that's very yeah. different from trying to earn it. Yes, of course. I mean, grace doesn't say, I'll do it over here. You can stay on your chaise long uh, with your mint julep under the palm trees. You know, yeah. I'll, do it, I'll do it over here. Right. No, we're drawn into that which is, right. which will make me lithe and uh, supple and strong and so forth. It, and to get from being, you know, pudgy and flaccid and weak and so on, uh, it does take some grunting and sweating, and I'm not earning, you know, that isn't making me earn right. heaven or something. Right. It's fitting me for the joy that I would give my gizzard to reach. Right. Um, well, I think, I mean. No, I, th I think uh, you're, you're right. This is, this is heavy stuff, which is appropriate. This is Socrates in the city. We're supposed to be, yeah. uh, we're supposed to be talking about heavy stuff. The, um, Bonhoeffer talks about, you know, cheap grace. Famously, he talks about yeah. this idea that uh, you can misapprehend the idea of grace and, yeah. and treat it as though it's nothing, it's when in fact it cost the blood yeah. of God, the death of God, yeah. um, so that we could have this grace. And yeah. so th the point he seems to be making is that if you do not respond yeah. in, in, a, in an exulting way, uh, way filled with gratitude yeah, to yeah. do anything you can to be closer to this God who has done this for you, then clearly you're not even aware that he's done it for you, which is to say yeah, yeah. you have not apprehended the grace. And so the grace is not yours because yeah. to, to apprehend it yeah. is naturally to have to respond, to want to feed the yeah. poor and to help yeah. people and to serve God. Yeah. In other words, to want to make God happy by blessing his creatures. Yeah. And, and so, so it, again, it's kind of a conundrum, the idea of grace, but it, yeah. it gets closer to yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Grace isn't, I mean, I, the usual, maybe the rather easy off the cuff notion of grace, it's, oh, well, oh, you mean I get a freebie? Yippee. Uh, well, in one sense, profoundly, it, it, it is a freebie. You can't, make it yourself. You, however, there's going to be blood, sweat, and tears, if you will. There may be en route to there. I mean, crossing the desert or rowing your way across the North Sea, what, you know, whatever metaphor you want, uh, it's, it's not going to be, you know, easy. Uh, however, it's it's going to be it's going to be exactly analogous to athletic training mm. or anything like that. You know, you're not going to be able to run the hundred yard dash in nothing flat without some sweat and some yeah. grunting uh, back here on the, the afternoons of you know 
practice? Since, um, well, uh, my, I'm, I saw a photo in the other room earlier of you with uh, Malcolm Muggeridge. Oh. Uh, he was in, was he in this house or in, the, in your other house? But you no, spent time with him. Yeah, he spent time with us, I guess. He stayed with us for a while. He so stayed he wasn't you, in this house. He stayed with you for, for a while. A lot of people won't know who he is. Um, yeah, right. And, of course, a lot of people will say, wow, you spent time with Malcolm Muggeridge. Yeah. Muggeridge is a particularly interesting character. Do you remember yes. how you came to know him? Or, or can, you, can you tell our audience who he was? If, if, if Lovelace were here, she'd go on backstage. Um, he was a... To say he was a, a journalist, yeah, it uh, doesn't do him justice. No, right? I mean he was he was a figure during the twentieth century. Uh, he was British, uh, a celebrated he, journalist, a celebrated oh, man cele of letters. Yes, we can say celebrated that. Celebrated man of letters, funny. I was going to say funny as hell, but funny as heaven. I mean he didn't you know, he edit Punch. He probably was the editor of Punch for a I while. I thought he I was the remember. editor of Punch for if a while. If he wasn't, something was wrong. But I'm, I'm, yeah. I suspect he was. Yeah. Probably. And you know, when he spent days or weeks with, you know, we spent the whole time laughing. You know. Just, and that was after, uh, obviously, after he'd become a Christian and after he'd become a yeah. Catholic. Probably. Was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we knew him before he was a believer. Yeah. Uh, well, his. It was a big. Uh, it was big news when Malcolm Muggeridge yeah. became a Christian. Yeah. I yeah. think. Yeah. I mean, maybe some people know him because he he's the man who introduced the world to a tiny Albanian nun called Mother Teresa. We yeah. wouldn't know about Mother yeah. Teresa if not for yeah. Malcolm Muggeridge, who yeah. made that yeah. film about her. Right. Something beautiful yeah. for, for God, God. Yeah. is the, the title. Uh, yeah. That's but true. Um, Muggeridge was a man of letters. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure what it was, maybe you remember, that led him to faith. You know, the, the, the trajectory of my flight toward faith or something, what is it? I, I can't give you uh, a day-by-day -day, uh, sequence right. of it because it was all of grace, he might say, although that wouldn't have been his language. But... Um, I know that uh, from talking to him, he uh, he he was hesitant about what what God used to finally bundle him along toward toward real understanding of Christianity and the faith and so on. That that can become a pro. I mean, that has been a problem. I would say for uh, let's say evangelical Christians is that they they come up with a paradigm. Um, actually, yeah, I mean, the right. Puritans, uh, Jonathan Edwards and company, were, they were famous for this, that they would have to have your story yeah. of conversion, and they set an incredibly high bar, unless you had yeah. this yeah. conversion story. And so yeah. people feel that almost like they have to make one up if they yeah. don't have one, yeah, you know? And so no, when people true. ask, people like Muggeridge or, or myself, so when did you become a Christian? Yeah. If, if it doesn't fit a perfect kind of, you know, the sawdust trail yeah. experience. Exactly. People don't know what to make of it. But your experience, I mean, you grew up as a Christian. There's no question. Yeah, right. Was there a moment yeah. at age five that you remember or no? No. But just to make sure, as a little kid, I probably a thousand times asked Jesus to come into my heart just in case and, and it, just, to be, just to be sure, you know. Right. And were you baptized as a child? Uh, yes, because uh, we were Episcopalians. I mean, evangelical Episcopalians. But you, you were? I was baptized as an infant, sprinkled. Uh, but I didn't know that your father was an Episcopalian. I thought that you no, had become an Episcopalian. I had myself, but technically, no, but, but when I was small, when they were first married, they went to the Reformed Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. The, uh, what's the, what was the name of it? The Church of the Atonement. But they sort of moved away from that into more fundamentalism and evangelicalism? Well, their, yeah, their eventual uh, locale or, you know, was American fundamentalism mm -hmm. and so on. But uh, neither, my, my mother had been raised an Episcopalian and my father had been raised a Presbyterian and they, they were uh, uh, 
Um, but they both had a, an evangelical story, you might say, you know, to tell uh, of really coming to understand the faith and mm -hmm. receiving Jesus as Savior and so yeah. on. You know. well, but for some people, it's, it's just much more complicated, and uh, yeah. so oh, it's yes. a process. Yes. yes, very much um, so. I guess I have to ask you, the, the, in, in the last uh, 20 or so years, the Catholic Church has had some terrible struggles. Uh, you're f familiar um, with what I'm talking about, and even now, with, with Pope Francis, many, many people are, are confused in, in a way at some yeah. of the things he says. Yeah, I mean, popes are not infallible. <laughs> you, I mean, a lot of people are under the misimpression yeah, that Catholics are. believe popes are infallible. No, I mean, it's only in a very rare occasion, probably a lot of popes never have, but, you know, uh, made a solemn promulgation of a dogmatic point or something. Uh, when they're speaking uh, ex cathedra. Ex cathedra, yes. Cathedra. Yeah. yeah. Cathedra? Yeah, but I think most people say cathedra now just because it, it looks. Yeah, no, that's I, good. I'm, good I will defer to you, sir. Well, for, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, whatever. If I'm going to say it, I might yeah. as well get it right. Because the only time the church would believe that the post Pope of Rome would be. Uh, uh, freed from error or, or uh, defended from error would be on the rare occasions, probably many popes never have, solemnly, quote, promulgated a dogma. Right. It, it, if, he, if he said, you know, that dog is a hound dog and you know that it's a Yorkie, right. uh, the guy's wrong. Right. But I thought he was a Catholic. That means he, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think pe so many people have a deep misunderstanding of the that idea. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, very much so. You're, but but you're I just right. know that my, my very serious Catholic friends are now troubled uh, by, by the current Pope and some of the things that he says. And it would be only on an extremely rare occasions when a Pope, and probably lots of Pope never have, quotes, solemnly promulgated a dogma. Right which is to be believed right. by Christians, uh, then at that point, uh, the belief is that God will protect the apostolic see from error. Right. Yeah. So that it's something, the, the, the belief would be that the Catholic Church, the Church Catholic, will, will never, before the Second Coming, fall into error, serious, mm -hmm error and so on. You can, you know, they might say that give the wrong number of miles to the sun or, you know, so forth and so forth. Right. Uh, but when it comes to solemn promulgating dogma, that's the only rare occasion right. when the, the, the whole, the apostolic see would be... Well, I always want to clarify that because people mis yeah. misunderstand no, it's, that. it's very rare. Well, yeah. I, I just think, you know, there's so many people that are, they, they show up, they're in yeah. the pews, yeah. But they're missing out, and yeah. I, and I think yeah. that your books, your book on being Catholic, uh, it, it, it's so beautiful uh, yeah. that uh, you know. And I don't want to say that it tempts me to want to become a, a, a Catholic, but what it does is it 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 helps me understand that the, the, you know the beauty yeah. of God is the beauty of God, and the truth of God is the truth of God, yeah. and yeah. and it's kind of a pity when we say, well, that's for you, and this is yeah. for us, and and yeah. I'd like to think that. You know, your work has, has given me an appreciation of the sacramental that nothing else I've ever read has done. Hmm. So maybe we can end with my thanking you for that. Well, good heavens. Uh, you've contributed a lot to my growth in soul and spirit. Well, I'm, Very I'm sure nice. that's not true, but thank you Here. for making me feel good no. about myself. No. Um, yeah. Folks, thanks for, for tuning in to Socrates and City. Tom, as I said earlier, I love you, and, uh, yeah. and I'm just so grateful for you giving me this well, time. Well, it's beautiful. Praise God. Absolutely.